Well, good morning, and thank you for coming out, despite what Bart did to us. Um, so, for those of you who were here yesterday, you heard Michael Manucciarese talk about um, how he related some technical roots of big data analysis to challenges that were faced by companies like Google and Yahoo when they dealt with commercial internet search. Essentially, the companies took on much more unstructured data than anybody had seen before at a rate of urgency nobody had had before, and they needed better means of analysis than that they could deploy over many computers at once in order to take on this problem. Now, Michael spoke of this in terms of leveraging parallelism, but another important aspect of the developments like Hadoop and MapReduce was in the types of analysis and the way that people started thinking about data. There was a much greater focus on one type of data in context with another. The meaning of a web page, say, could be relevant to what it was saying, but it could be relevant to an ad that was going to be placed against the search results or what you might look at next. Effectively, the data in this framework moves from something largely stative to something increasingly potential. It's meant to be used in different contexts to derive different meanings at all times. And this turns out to be a rather deep change for both the technology and the way we think about the world and how we use this data. This churning contextualization of data is at the heart of what we call big data today, which assumes we will find hitherto unseen patterns and truths by looking at ecosystems of facts, or now do I put that word in inverted commas, <laughs> facts, um, at something like the same time this was being figured out it, by internet companies, something equally interesting was going on in the physical world. Very cheap data storage and abundant sensors made it possible to count and tag and monitor things around us as never before. Combine that with network systems that allowed easy sharing of data repositories, and we started affecting a transformation of something much larger than what the internet had done. We have started chasing the creation of internet-type ecosystems of fact that are far more complex and promising as they stretch out across the physical world than anything that was established on the internet itself. I mentioned this to Kate Crawford at the reception last night, and she generously gave me the term, the materiality of the network, which I intend to steal shamelessly from now on. The complexities of Google search and Facebook's social graph will quite likely soon be dwarfed by the data storage and analysis that takes place over our physical and social worlds in near real time. While these are quite exciting prospects, it's probably worth noting that these will also begin in less than perfect ways. You will be led to believe by the industries that push them out there. They seek perfection, but they will deliver something akin to the kind of ads you get on Facebook or Twitter's fail whale or what search bots deliver on Google but they will also get much, much better, and it will not stop, and the system will eventually seek something very effective. Now, before any of this gets too far down the line, we have the opportunity to think about what this means when the habits and tropes of Internet companies go into the creation of a materialized network. In particular, what are the methods that are still effective? How must they change? What are issues around data clarity and data cleanliness? What happens with this kind of scale and complexity that's different from what we, when we were doing it just inside web pages? And as we build this out, do we also impose more unwanted Internet-type constraints on our own behaviors and understanding of a much more complex physical and social world, demanding that certain behaviors fit inside one or another analytic categories? Well, joining me to solve all of the world's problems in the next 35 or 40 minutes our Douglas Merrill, a former, former senior executive at Google who now specializes in using real-world signals to form risk models for lending. And then Tyler Bell of Factual, a data market that specializes in data cleanliness in both real-world and Internet data. And Anthony Goldblum of Kaggle, which runs contests for data teams using real-world data. I've kept the descriptions of their businesses purposely somewhat vague because I'd rather hear them in their own terms in the context we'll be talking about this morning. You can also read their biographies in the um, brochures you've been given. But let me join you all and talk about a little bit about what you do with reference to the size and the complexity of what you're working on. So it is now Zest Finance? Zest, Zest Finance, yeah. Zest Finance, okay. It's been, it's been that way for more than a year. Um, so if you think about underwriting, the process of giving credit, it more or less hasn't changed since 1950. 
when Bill Fair and Walter Isaacs came out uh, with a, the book they ultimately called FICO. Before 1950, more or less, you got credit in the following way. You would go to a bank, you would sit, wow, not to be light. <laughs> you would sit in front of a desk, uh, you'd be across the desk from a man in a suit with a red tie. They were all men, uh, and they all had the same suit. They shared it in some complex way. And you would say, hey, look, can I, can I have a loan? And he would look at you and say, oh, you know, our kids are in Sunday school together, or, you know, I see you at baseball practice. And based on all this kind of weird interpersonal connections, he would decide, yes, loan, no loan. Now, that worked well in one perspective, which is the person used a lot of data, a lot of context to make that decision. The downside is, what about people who didn't go to Sunday school with your kid? That doesn't necessarily make them bad credit risk. It just means they're something else. In 1950, um, Fair and Isaac came up with a really good idea. They took a recent development in mathematics that was the ability to easily compute the logistic regression with uh, the side development that suddenly there were credit bureaus with reasonably good standard data. And they had what was an, at the time an amazing recollection that, excuse me, realization that they could take this data from the credit bureau, apply it to a logistic regression, it would work really quickly, it converged really quickly, it would get a reasonably good standard score, and all of a sudden you could give credit to someone even if you didn't know what Sunday school they went to. It was a massive transformation. It radically increased credit availability. Yay for us. The problem is, when you move from a world in which there's relatively little data, the credit bureaus, it's relatively good, it's relatively clean, uh, to a world in which the credit bureaus are a little bit messy, there's lots of incomplete data, there's lots of stuff which is just wrong. All of a sudden, Fair Isaac's methodology breaks down. The logistic regression carrying six to 10 variables no longer can account for the reality of our world, the materiality, if you will, of the internet, which is to say a lot of data is just floating around and a lot of it's wrong. I came into this space with the sort of Google mathematical approach, which is why would you use six to 10 variables when you could use hundreds? On, on practice, actually, we use tens of thousands of variables because all data is credit data. And the reason we use tens of thousands of variables is we're trying to recreate that guy across the table in the blue suit and the red tie, but with massive credit availability. So I can use an entire context of you as a human to make a credit decision. And that context is developed not from knowing you, but from knowing all these thousands of things about you. So I can use increased credit availability from beyond what FICO can do, but with this characteristic of knowing you as a person, not just you as five or six variables. And is it a Google-type approach, essentially? In effect, when you work it out, did things change? Um, I'm not 100% sure I understand your question, Quentin. Well, it, which it, is it, the sign that Quentin's smarter than me. No. In case there was any question. No, it's a sign I wasn't articulate. It, as you use various real-world data, does the approach differ from Internet search, or is it the same, essentially? It's actually much harder. Um, Internet search is a massive problem. I'm really proud of what we did at Google, the teams of engineers and ML people at Google have you know, changed the game, democratizing information. It was a really awesome place to be. But ranking web pages is slightly easier uh, than deciding whether to make a loan or not. First of all, ranking web pages is a relatively transient phenomenon. If I get it wrong this time, it doesn't matter. In a fraction of a second, I'll get it right. Uh, we used to say the results don't have to be right, they have to be fast. In this case, the results don't really have to be fast. We make our decisions in about two and a half seconds, which is pretty slow. Um, but they need to be right. So it's a sort of a more challenging problem, and we use a lot more signals than Google did. Mm -hmm. Tyler? Right, so uh, I'm at a company called Factual. We're based out of LA. Um, we're looking to solve two uh, very specific problems that uh, developers and publishers encounter in the mobile world, increasingly mobile world. Uh, the first is uh, deals with location. So uh, the majority of us within this audience carry a highly sophisticated sensor platform in our pocket. Um, uh, that sensor platform right now is uh, doesn't send very much back to the server to help the application understand who you are and how you behave um, so that it can better custom customize and personalize both the interaction of the program and the content it serves you. One data point it does send back is longitude and latitude. Um, uh, and it will send this back, uh, if you're a GPS uh, user, it'll send it back as you drive. Uh, if you use something like Twitter or any other app, it might just send a location back occasionally, maybe when you fire up the device or when you perform certain actions. It depends entirely by the program and it de depends entirely by the, the permissions you've given it. Now, uh, the interesting thing about using location is that even though we have this space-age post-NASA device in our pocket, 
Uh, we use location incredibly with, without any degree of sophistication. So uh, uh, this sensor platform sends uh, longitude and latitude back. Um, the majority of applications will consume that and say, all right, this person's here now. What do we do? What do we do? And it's really just that longitude and latitude, that naked coordinate pair. Uh, there's two things that aren't known about it. One is, is how does that translate? What does that naked coordinate pair, pair mean? What is the geographic context for that, both in the commercial world as in the natural geographic world? So yes, I'm in the, the town of Berkeley, but, but specifically what building, what event, what, what's the temporal, what's the spatial, what's the social context for that point? So it's actually adding context around the geographic element itself, but also adding geographic, and this is I think is the more important thing, is adding the context around the individual. There's a significant tension now in the mobile world where our mobile phones, unlike our desktops, are designed specifically for our individual use. They aren't shared. We carry this with us. It stays with us. It is slowly becoming uh, synonymous with our own identity. It's becoming an identity platform. Uh, the problem there, though, is that uh, every, the way that money is made on the Internet now, and the way that money is made through the applications you read in your phone and you access on your phone, is all through advertising. And advertising is basically, to, to sum it up in very crude terms, it's chucking you into a bucket. It's designed for something called audience segmentation, where any signals about you, you get thrown into the mom's bucket, or the singles, or the 18 to 34 bucket, or the avid moviegoers, or live sports fan bucket. So you're being grouped in this really coarse collection of individuals, and if, you, if, if they get it wrong, you might see the wrong ad, no harm. So that's going off in one direction. That's traditional advertising, internet advertising specifically. The other direction you have is this whole idea of personalization. The phone is a personal device, but we receive very, very little, little personal information on our phone. And so consumers are beginning to want this, and it's going slowly because there's issues of, of privacy uh, that are directly associated with personalization we have to be aware of. And then you have advertising, and this thin skein between them is, is, is ready to snap. Um, and so the, the mobile world is moving towards personalization, but there's no context for the individual. So the first person, uh, the first problem that, that Factual is trying to solve is helping companies learn about the, the real world context of, of locations, but also the real world context of individuals. Uh, what's, the, what's the demographic, the contextual background? What's the behavioral background for these individuals? One interesting wellspring of this was you started out with attributes very much of a data mart, and you collect information on all sorts of things and clean up the data so it's reliable. And um, there was almost a problem there because how do you find a central organizational principle for that much data? And it turned out to be something irreducible, which was geography. How many different... Last time I looked, it was something like 20 or 30 million geographic points around which data was organized, right? <coughs> We have uh, 65 million places in 50 countries. Yeah, and each of those places might have 20, 30 attributes. Yeah, depending on the place. So Factual uses the term place in a, a, a pretty generic sense, right? right? Which means like it's basically a commercial entity or uh, it's a point of interest or, yeah. or a monument. And it's really, uh, it, it, think of this as sort of a counterpoint a counter semantic framework to, to maps. Maps are visual or cartographical, uh, linear, non fuzzy, hard lines and boundaries. Uh, this sort of semantic idea of place is much more relational, uh, it's much more fuzzy, and it's much more personal. Right. Uh, but it's also very commercial. You know, as, as you and I, and as, as our, everyone in the audience moves throughout the physical world, we're engaging, yes, with other people, but we're engaging with institutions, organizations, and physical places. And it's that, it's that latter part that Factual aims to capture, is that, that place-focused that, that place uh, uh, awareness, sort of a, was... a placial way of thinking rather than a spatial way of thinking, which is maps. Yes, it's, it's almost something like a page with different attributes, and there are 65 million of them. You just have to see who's moving around in them. I was recently at a company called Euclid Analytics, also former Google people, and they, um, they use Wi-Fi antennas, little pieces of software in them. You know these guys? They, um, you know, the, the, they're always trying to offload your signal the, and onto Wi-Fi. The phone companies really don't want your signal most of the time. They're trying to offload it. So you're always pinging the local Wi-Fi antenna to see if it can be loaded onto there instead. And they use that dynamic to 
see the movement of people, yeah. even anonymous. The movement of people around places becomes very interesting. They um, can sell this to a department store and see, relative to the traffic moving through the store, how many came in. Well, if you change the display, do more come in or fewer? If you have two antennas, you can triangulate and see where they went once they got into the store. What was interesting about this to me was, in the pitch, talking about this company, they said, well, web retailers have cookies, so they can follow you around. We're just giving the real world stores the same kind of capability, which is to say, now we're all cookies, and this is the means by which we get tagged. And we just move through the world being tagged this way, which is something along the lines of what you're saying. Very much. <laughs> Is that a good thing or a bad thing? It's just a thing. Well, I mean, I, I, I don't want to, to uh, there's, there's a whole sort of another seminar series there, <laughs> right? right. It, in terms of the, the, the tracking and personalization. Yeah, it's not exactly a newsflash that conceptions of privacy are changing or that online and offline are kind of merging into one. Indeed, there's, uh, I mean, the two models that we see emerging, is one is, is basically aggregated uh, uh, anonymity. So individuals are sort of the individual data signals are, are stripped of any uh, PII, personally identifiable information, uh, and then aggregated with hundreds of thousands and then sort of broken down and, and you can sort of look at things in, in the whole but it can't be uh, uh, broken down into its uh, constituting parts. Now, um, the other thing that we're, certainly the direction that, and that's interesting, there's a lot that you can do there and it, and it works. What, what Factual is trying to do is something uh, orthogonal to that, which is saying, um, let's move away from the anonymous profiles. Let's develop a profile for, for the four individuals up here. We each have an individual profile. But uh, that individual profile is for consumption only by the application that, that developed it. So a, a terrible thing in the uh, location world, and basically in the, in the commercial world, right, you know, working with sort of Equifax and FICO, is that your data is bought and sold without your knowledge or, or under, indeed understanding about who has it, how they consume it. It's information about you. You go into any one of these sites, and they will tell you your, your, your deepest history and where you live and how many children you have and who they are. And it's, it's, it's mined from publicly accessible information. What Factual is trying to do is saying, look, let's silo that. Even though you know, traditionally I and Factual are very keen to break down and bridge silos when it comes to individual profiles, the profile that's created in, in, in one application with whom you have a trusted relationship, uh, that profile should not be translated across to different applications. And so that, that's the approach that we're trying to take, is saying that it's not a question of opening, op, opening everything up and all of a sudden we don't have any privacy. It's that, yes, you know, we are developing a very personal profile for individuals, uh, but fundamentally it, is, it will not move. It stays as a siloed component within the app that created it. So I don't want to take Anthony's time, but just to kind of reflect a little bit on, on this. Um, within about three-quarters of a second, for every applicant, we pull more than 11,000 variables about that applicant. Um, 250 milliseconds, not very long. Um, those data elements include a bunch of things which you might find humorous. Uh, roughly 10% of my customers show up in the credit bureau as being dead. <laughs> we of course call them zombie buyers, as, <laughs> as you would. Um, and the net implication of having that many uh, zombie borrowers is that when the zombie apocalypse comes, my business will take <laughs> over the world. <laughs> Uh, anyway, leaving that, leaving that aside, but what's amazing is the degree of information I have about you is pretty impressive. Impressive not entirely in a good way. So we do a lot of work at Zest, much as we did at Google, to lose all of the, the PII sort of as fast as we can, because uh, it's not good for anyone to have some of that stuff you know, lying around. Well, the horrifying truth is it's not that relevant either. Like years ago, back when Google was a little more forthright about these things, somebody Dude. said to me, <laughs> you know, somebody said to me, well, we really don't want the name. The name is a hassle. The name and the address, those kind of, uh, we get enough in other ways to personalize all we want. And yet, there's actually, in our case, it's not entirely true. So for example, it's a credit signal in our model. When you enter your name, Quentin, if you do all lowercase, if you do capital Q, all lowercase, or if you do capital all, the way you enter your name is a credit signal because all data is credit data. The challenge is what data can you toss away and when can you toss it away? And it turns out that we have to spend a lot of time trying to figure out what's the earliest possible moment we can toss this piece of data away about you. Um, but I think 
I think we're actually arguing for almost the opposite of what, uh, of what Factual is saying. And you know, Gil Elbaz, the founder, and I are old friends, so I'm allowed to uh, attack Factual here. Um, we believe, actually, that you shouldn't silo information. What you should do is give people economic recompense for using their information. Right? So don't use it in an abusive fashion where I, you know, I buy it from Quentin and use it to push some ad on you that you don't want. You know? But rather, take Quentin's information and use it to offer Quentin a valuable prospect, which is worth more than the ad. And oftentimes that means not kind of this trivial opt-in or this sort of trivial I'm running an app so I want to see an ad, but a more complicated commercial interaction. People, I believe will trade much of their privacy for economic value to wit. How many of you have those little cards for grocery stores, like the, the Vons Club card, or the, most of you do, uh, and there's no upside for you. All you're doing is giving a bunch of data away from you for a trivial little recompense, and everyone's happy to do it. So I actually don't believe that siloing is the long-term right answer. I think the long-term right answer is finding ways to provide value, and that, ladies and gentlemen, is a spectacular segue. <laughs> <laughs> to means of analysis. The, uh, Yes. Um, so I run a company called Kaggle, and the problem we're trying to solve is that um, so in order to do great data science, you need great data scientists. And this is particularly important because most... So data science is used to make decisions, uh, and a lot of the decisions data science helps with, help with are extremely high leverage. So you in, take the Zest example. One algorithm or a series of algorithms will decide whether or not you get a loan, um, and that's how loans are granted. Uh, and so, you know, the problem is that an algorithm in that, or data science done by a bad data scientist can cause an, an enormous amount of damage. And data science done by brilliant data scientists can generate an, an enormous amount of value. Uh, so we started life running data mining competitions. Uh, we have 100,000 data scientists in our community, and they're all ranked from 1 to 100,000 based on their performances. Um, and so companies buy from us in two ways. Um, traditionally, They've bought uh, a competition, so they throw up a data set and uh, they get the algorithm back at the end of the competition. And uh, just recently we started a one-on-one -on -one matching service where a company comes to us with a problem and we match them with, based on our history with a particular data scientist, uh, we can match them with the data scientist who's most likely to do a great job on that problem. Uh, now, we were talking about, the, uh, initially we are talking about complexity yes. and the materiality of the internet. I think it's... Um, Interesting. It, certainly, there are problems uh, that Kaggle has tackled that, on the surface, I would have thought were very simple problems. Uh, so we worked recently with, um, uh, this comes to mind because we were talking about it just before the panel, uh, with General Electric on a problem to help them predict flight arrival times uh, for different airports, different airlines. Um, and what they, the, the, the utility of this algorithm is that uh, for every minute you can improve a prediction about when a flight's going to arrive, an airline will save $6 million over the course of a year. And the reason for this is, you know, when a flight lands, a lot has to happen. You've got the food, the people um, who uh, put, clean the airplanes and restock them with food and refuel them. And uh, if you can very accurately predict when a flight's going to arrive, you can better allocate those resources. Um, so on the surface of it, it, it seemed like a, a, a super simple problem until we realized that uh, there were 30 different data sources. Um, these data sources range from uh, weather, where the airport is at the snapshot in time where you're making the prediction, um, weather across, along the whole flight, flight path that the plane's going to be taking, weather at the, at the airport where the plane will be landing, what the congestion's like at the airport, um, what the congestion, where other planes are at any point in time. Um, so to do a good job on a, on a problem that on the surface sounds very simple, actually, uh, you know, given the amount of data sources available, um, turns out to be extremely, uh, th there's a lot to it. Um, it's, what's really interesting about this problem was that the best, uh, it's air traffic control predicts on average within seven minutes of the flight's actual arrival time. And presumably they're using uh, relatively unsophisticated methods. I, I'm, I'm not sure what those methods are. Um, but the value is there if you can, if you have a way to assimilate the 30 different data sources and the crazy complexity, there's an enormous amount of value. So the end result of the project that we did with General Electric was 
uh, an algorithm that, pred that predicted flight arrival time within four minutes of the, um, of the actual across uh, flights across a year. So if you can master uh, the, the, the crazy complexity, there's an enormous <coughs> amount of value to be gained. And as you um, build out these kind of material realizations of the internet, the level of interaction and complexity for companies that own very large data sets become just enormous. I'm, I'm writing about this, and not to give away too much, inside the general electric world, you can look at power generation in the context of very large steam turbines. You can then drill that down into what the electrical grid is doing, what other sources of power might be doing, what the battery inside, say, a wind turbine is doing, and the history of objects inside that battery that was made in a factory that has 10,000 dimensional space because of all the sensors that have been put inside this. And the, each cell of the battery comes with its own blog effectively saying what chemicals it came, it, it was made from and what time. So you have this, you know, they're, they're, they're almost realizing, you know, uh, they're trying to identify the butterfly and the butterfly effect. You know, they, they really think you, you, you can master this kind of stuff. And if you're working at scale, changes of, what did you call it? Information torque. You know, if you have a very, very large scale of your financial model, for example, a change in one one hundredth of one percent can work out enormously. A, a stat they gave me was for a national rail system, improving speed to towards maximum efficiency of one mile an hour is $200 million a year. So they have a huge incentive to try and examine these large complex systems. Now, how well can that be done? So let me just, um, let me just try and give a, a kind of a practical example with the problem. Um, there's a huge difference between significant and important. Oftentimes you can find data which looks significant, which is actually completely valueless. Uh, until Anthony moved about 30 seconds ago, three of the four men on the stage had their right leg cross over their left leg. Two of the four <laughs> had them at their ankle, the third had it at the knee. I was the only one who had my left leg cross over my right leg, and I moved it flat in case this point came up. <laughs> <laughs> Where are you going with this bong hit? <laughs> wow, that was good. <laughs> there you go, there's your leading line. Um, the question is, that's a very powerful signal. You can absolutely identify me by saying which leg was crossed over which leg. Perfect signal, 100% correctness. Vastly significant and completely meaningless, I think, I hope. I, I, I have no idea what the meaning would be either. We'll examine that in the next panel, actually. <laughs> Great. <laughs> so the problem is that uh, as you get more and more signals, particularly as you get more and more data, more and more things seem important because they seem significant, because they will segment some amount of the space, right? An infinite number of monkeys will eventually create Quentin's articles. <laughs> and have far fewer monkeys than that. So that's the challenge. Um, people believe as you bring more signals and you bring more bits to bear, you're going to naturally get more information. You're going to get more of something. It's not clear you get more information. You should argue with me now because you shouldn't believe this. Well, um, I was thinking about, I mean, the, it, so this, I suppose, argues for having great data scientists. So air traffic control, for the longest time, had, um, you know, they've been able to do something uh, with the data feeds they get, but not all that much. Um, if you have crazily good talent, Google S talent, presumably S, S, S talent, Kaggle Excellent. S talent. Um, Don't forget factual. Uh, factual S talent. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, you can actually do some pretty impressive things. Um, and so I, I think you're helping make a case for my business, so thank you. So you have 100,000 data scientists. You have a clutch of smart people. You have a clutch of smart people. Are the standards and practices converging, or are they diverging as we look at different data sets in different contexts? I might jump in. So we, um, we are a, a great chronicler of best practice in data science, uh, basically, because we run these competitions and we see what's successful. Um, the, um, the somewhat dispiriting fact that we find is that um, the, the, the thing that, that differentiates great data science from, it, from poor data science is basically creativity. Um, I know that 
so you can take a, What's the dispiriting part about that? Well, it's dispiriting because it's not automa can't automate it. automatable. Yeah, exactly. Also, it's again good for our business. Right. <laughs> um, you can't encode taste. You can't. Well, you can't encode. Uh, you can't encode creativity. So, to give you a sense for what I mean, um, I would say probably about ninety percent of our competitions are won by an algorithm called Random Forest, which is basically a good algorithm because it's really it's super simple. It was invented in this university, actually. Um, uh, don't hold that against it. <laughs> it's 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 super simple to use, um, but uh, a random forest in the hands of a creative data science scientist is very different from the ran a random forest in the hands of a, um, a a poor data scientist or the less creative data scientist. And to give kind of a real world example, I know I've given you this example before. Uh, it's, it's probably my favourite. We had a we did a, a competition to predict uh, which used cars were going to be. Uh, which used cars sold at a second-hand auction were going to be good buyers and which weren't. So does anyone want to take a guess as to what the most um, valuable signal was? So you've got make of the car, model of the car, age of the car. Anyone want Color. No, you can't say that. You've ruined my anecdote. <laughs> what about color? So, so uh, usual color and unusual color turned out to be... Uh, the, 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 what the data scientists did was they took color and they grouped it into standard color cars and unusual color cars. And they found that unusual color cars um, uh, were much more reliable than standard color cars. And um, the, the intuition there is probably that if you're the first buyer of an unusual color car, you're an enthusiast, therefore you look after the car better. And so by the time, uh, by the time it's sold at a second-hand auction, it's... Um, it's, uh, it's in good condition. By asking for orange, you're saying something about yourself. Exactly. And therefore you're projecting, you care for it the way you might care for yourself. Exactly. Now, what did the data scientists do in order to find that uh, anecdote? They didn't, they didn't like just have an epiphany in the shower. They came up with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of different like hypotheses as to what would uh, constitute a reliable car or what would indicate that a car is likely to be reliable. So they tested things like, you know, they grouped car colour into dark colour cars and light colour cars on the assumption that maybe dark colour cars are more likely to get into accidents because uh, they don't get seen at night. That turned out to be not relevant. They looked at wheel, tire size, or wheel size, I think it was, because if you have big wheels, maybe you souped up your car and so you rode it harder. That turned out not to be useful. And so they, they, they iterate over lots and lots and lots and lots of hypotheses uh, and find the handful of hypotheses that turn out to be meaningful. Um, and so you know, to, to, come back to, the, uh, to come back to the question, you know, are we zeroing in on, on what great uh, data science and what great data analytics looks like? Um, we've certainly seen that by far the most important characteristic is, of, of great data science is the ability to come up with interesting hypotheses and, and either validate them as being true or not. Um, on, on the data. So uh, Tyler, I, sorry, go ahead. If I can just pile on to that, we talk a lot about um, talk a lot about, about underwriting as a com combination of, of art and science. You know, the science is you know mathematics and computer science. It's relatively well understood. It's the art where all the leverage is, um, because uh, exactly to Anthony's point, there's so much leverage in figuring out what to do with with, with the data, with the sig turning a, turning a variable into a signal involves a lot of magic sometimes. So I use the example of lowercase versus correct case versus uppercase. That was not found syntactically. That was found by an analyst thinking, you know what? One of the things that might predict credit quality is your kind of rule-following behavior. And your rule-following behavior is use an uppercase for your first letter, right? We have a bunch of other signals that we call those generative signals. We start with 11,000 variables and expand it into 70,000 signals. And that expansion from 11 to 70 is all about people figuring out that odd-colored cars are better cars, or you know, people that type in all uppercase are worse credit. Or you see a date, a date to somebody, a date looks like a date, but to a data scientist, they'll know that it, it's got a lot of information embedded in there. It's month of year. It's is it summer? Is it winter? Is it peak hour? Is it is it rush hour? Is it not? Um, well, does it, this this was where I was going with my question to you, Tyler. You had a, a kind of interesting background getting into truth, or <laughs> the, the, the truth business, which was. I'm going to get this wrong, but I believe archaeology and matching M4A, different contexts, and establishing where things were when. Cool. And that was a small slice of sort of a, a larger problem, which is, is a fact a durable thing or is a fact a relative thing? Is, and 
do they branch from 10,000 to 70,000 to more and more attributes infinitely with any particular value? The, uh, uh, the, the exercise of archaeology is, 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 is basically trying to convince your audience that a, that a probability is a certainty. And there's the, the, there's the basically the sort of uh, old trope of, uh, an, uh, of an archaeologist reconstructing an entire civilization from three pot charts. <laughs> um, and uh, it, it, it very often, the, uh, you know, when, when, the, when the data is not there, uh, you, you fill it. You fill it with assumptions, and those assumptions can be easy, quickly taken as, as fact and perpetuated on from, from uh, professor to student on down until some young punk-ass undergraduate feel, realizes that you've been doing it wrong We assumed along. dinosaurs were lizards, and we <laughs> took us 100 years to figure out they might have color. Exactly. So the, the, like the, these, well. these facts, right, which are, you know, theories, but, but basically they are perpetuated uh, because uh, perpetuating is, is extremely easy to do. It's the path of, of least resistance. Uh, and the things that change that are new ways of thinking, new tools, and, and, and new data. Um, and, and that's in part how I made the, the um, sort of curious segue from, from the archaeology of the late Roman Empire to, uh, to um, understanding how um, humans engage with the, with the world around them. But do you find that um, at what point are you happy that a data point or a fact is clear and true at this point? Uh, so, I mean, I guess the, the absolute term is never, right? Um, uh, we, um, w one thing that factual does well, which is really required in, uh, I mean, so I'll back up a bit and, and um, start with the, the, uh, an interesting George Dyson quote where he talks about the world of big data and liken it to a canoe. And he says that formerly we, we lived in a world of uh, basically uh, Inuit canoes, Alaskan canoes, where there was so little wood that the wood was used very, very sparingly to create the structure of the canoe, and then, then skin and other materials would be used to craft it. And he says that, that that was 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Now we're living in the world of the dugout canoe, where there's so much gosh darn wood that we're actually removing it and burning it to build the structure. That's clumsier and slower moving. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the, the metaphor only goes so far, okay. of course. Um, but, 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 the, but the idea there is that the, the question is not that we don't have enough information, it's that we have very often too much. Uh, it's heterogeneous, it's duplicative, and it's highly erroneous and extremely fragmentary. So one thing that Factual does is when we work with, a, say, a, a place online, it could be this university, it could be a store down the road, um, usually there's hundreds if not thousands of data points that describe this entity uh, on the internet and, and, and in other databases, and usually they, they all con conflict. Uh, so what we do is, is to bring those together into what we call a canonical entity. Uh, we'll look at all the different values. So we do this on a per-attribute basis, and we have normalization and standardization rules on, on per-attributes. And we look at the different sources that we've assigned trust metrics to. So some, some sources can be more trustworthy, and we learn this both through human annotation as well as machine learning. And we say, okay, these are, these are the trusted sources. These are all the different values. Now, what is the consensus for each, for each attribute. So even though our company is called Factual, we are basically a, a, a machine should consensus. Should be called consensual? Service. It should be called, <laughs> yes, machine consensual, but it just doesn't roll off the tongue as well. <laughs> and, and, and really that's the, uh, e even though yes, we have verification, even though the, I mean, so here's an example, right? Like the whole question of facts, People say, I want an absolute truth. I want a gold standard in local data. One doesn't exist. If it existed, we'd all be using them. Yeah. One doesn't exist. So, this, so most people say, well, let's, let's make this easy. Let's call each business and have them tell us what they are and where they are. But businesses act in their own best interest. So they will very often use words, keywords, annotations, and geographies to describe themselves that aren't factual, that aren't necessarily truthful. But they'll use the, the sort of real estate agent's approach <laughs> to describing things because it's in their best interest. Beverly yeah. yeah. Hills adjacent. Exactly. Thank you. <laughs> and, and, it, and that's very different from the way the consumer faces it. Right. So, so you know, w without getting uh, particularly philosophical here, the idea is, is that our uh, approach to creating factual data is, is, is our using the best tools available to create the best data. Available. Well, I will get philosophical. I mean, you are making an interesting point about epistemology, which is, in a lower fact world, we had more certainty. 
And as we have more facts and understanding of relationships, we start working into a, a world of much more approximation and probability. There's a, there's a great quote about the guy who has one watch knows exactly what time it is. The, the person who has two is never sure. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, you can, but you can walk that the other way, right? There's accuracy versus precision. With uh, a small number of data sources, you're often quite precise, right? You know, your one watch is, is precise. But I bet none of the two of us agree on what time it is, and my watch doesn't agree with that. Oh, clock. I don't think we changed the species particularly. We were always kind of wandering around working in probabilities and gut instincts. But we just we thought didn't we were know it. Yeah. Right? So the, the, it just wasn't clear. You know, so as we move towards precision, we get more and more confused. But you could, you can, every time you see a, a, a non-epistemological, actual physical transi transition, you get the same thing, right? Horses to cars. Suddenly, your perspective was quite different. How you felt was quite different. The original days of TV were people videoed standing in front of a, a hanging microphone talking, which is basically filming radio. Every time you change the context, you have this accuracy versus precision trade-off. And what I think, sort of where Tyler was going, uh, I thought was, it was pretty exciting around how do you regain precision in a world where you don't have this notion of accuracy? And that's mm -hmm. about you know, fixing erroneous data, understanding trends, et cetera. And then over time, there's this sociological, psychological transition from precise and confused to, to <laughs> precise and accurate. And yeah. that's 10 years, right? It was 10 years, it was 15 years with cars, right? So where does this lead? You think we become more comfortable with a certain level of uncertainty and the best possible answer at this time? And like data itself becoming kind of more potential and less stative, less certainty? Yeah, that I changes what companies do in some ways. For sure. And you asked a binary question, and I bet you get Turnery answers. Because yeah. I bet none of the two of us will agree on your question. I'm good with that. <laughs> so I think, you, um, I think people don't actually, in the long term, care about accuracy. I don't think they actually care about comfort with accuracy. No one checks the, the, whether their speedometer is correct or not until they've gotten a, a speeding ticket that they don't think they deserve. Until there's some third party trigger, nobody actually cares about accuracy. We think we care about accuracy right now because we're losing it. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think nothing ever changes with our comfort. Bless you. <laughs> well, we live in a relative world, right? So it, it, we're, as long as there's a... When I say relative, I, I think it's actually more a question of granularity. So coming to the speedometer or coming back to the, to the watch example, um, you know, they're, they're all telling roughly the same time, certainly on the minute, down to the second, less so, and down to the, to the millisecond, certainly not. Mm -hmm. um, and so you know, one of the problems that we wrestle with explicitly, and I'm sure my colleagues wrestle, here, wrestle with here as well, uh, is, is understanding our state of knowledge uh, at different granularities. Uh, and this could be you know, a geographic granularities, so we're sure we have the, the postcode right, but the longitude and latitude might, might be a little bit wonky. Uh, but what's the business use case? How much do we need to invest to get that down to, all right, we have it within 10 meters now, do we really need to get it any, any more mm -hmm. accurate? Mm -hmm. And you know, understanding the actual sort of end use case from a, from a business decision is, 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 is critical when, when building the, the data models and building your, your basically knowledge models as well. Because fundamentally, at the end of the day, this is not an academic exercise. It's, it's solving real world business problems. And um, you, know, you, you, you make trade offs, and it helps you understand your data better. Mm -hmm. I don't think I have much to add about and beyond what Tyler said. I stole all my wonderful points. Lame. <laughs> <laughs> That's lame. Well, you got something. You know, I'll tweak it a bit. Do the customers know how much data they have? Do they know what problems they want to solve? Do they understand what to do with all this stuff? Or do they kind of just present it to you and say, we think there's something here. Please help us along. Um, so the, uh, the thing that Kaggle sells most of is what we call a diagnostic project, where um, this is in the one-on-one -on -one matching world, where a company will say, I've got this data. I kind of have this sense that I can answer this question with it. Um, but I I'm not really sure, is it possible? Um, so the fact that that is the thing that we sell the most of um, probably suggests that it's, it's really early. Um, it's, it's really early. I think that um, you know, for all the, the, the excitement around big data, I think it's a long road before it really starts to impact the way uh, businesses work. I think um, you know, companies like General Electric are um, 
are wonderful, but there aren't that many of them. Uh, and more, more Fortune 500s that we deal with are sort of in the dipping their toes in, uh, trying to get a sense for what data can help with and, and, and um, you know, what, yeah, where data can be helpful. Mm -hmm. We found that just giving data to the companies has, uh, is not a successful approach. Basically, the skills and the ways of thinking, the accessibility of raw data and how it's consumed is, is still at a, at a you know, pretty high level. You've got to have some special people in place. Mm -hmm. And this is why data scientists get paid so much more than quants. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, uh, and and we've, we've changed our products as, as a result. We said, here's our base level of data, and we can still sell that. And it's just data in a tab delineated file, or you can access it through the API. But here are some tools actually on top of that where we, we've reprocessed the data for you. Um, you know, give us the longitudes and latitudes and, and we'll, you know, we'll basically build a profile based upon those longitudes and latitudes. So we've, we've taken very specific uh, business use cases and then we've, we've basically built on receptors of our data that are designed for each use case. Mm -hmm. And that's proved very successful so far. Mm -hmm. um. We started a little late, so why don't we take a couple of minutes of questions? Yeah, okay. Questions from the audience? I think there are people with microphones. Do we have? Sir. Roberta? Back behind you. Um, I, I have a question, uh, quite a general question. So accepting those variables and trying to find a signal in them actually brings another problem. You're introducing noise in what used to be a well-established procedure. If I'm hiring someone, I don't really consider many things except his employment history and the knowledge of what color is he preferring of, for his car or what case he's typing would probably distract me. So, and that noise has been filtered away by the common sense and the experience of our life for a reason. Now you're bringing it back and it looks more like, I don't know, less than efficient way to, to extract the data. What I'm trying to say is that there are well-established channels of for obtaining relevant information, relevant data. And people are using those channels efficiently. And introducing more information which is not very relevant may actually distract us from doing something good. So let me, you know, yes, clearly adding useless information into a process cannot create information. But let me push on, 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 on two aspects of what you said. First one, on, on hiring. Um, at my previous employer, we quantified a large number of things to a relatively stupid degree of detail. Um, and then what we would do is if you decided to hire a person, uh, obviously if you've not hired, you can't do what I'm about to say. If you hired someone, you then measured their quarterly performance ratings uh, and a set of other outcomes and tried to see, are there any signals we grab at hiring that predicted performance? Uh, and originally, the hiring process was pretty much what you would expect, you know, school, some, some you know, encoding of employment history, and all that stuff was relatively random with respect to performance. I bring that up not because Google was or wasn't a good hiring engine, yeah, your mileage may vary, but because a lot of times there are situations in which we think we know what matters, and actually empirically it's not so clear that it does. So we ended up doing a much better job of hiring by including some different signals in hiring that had been done before. We didn't like care what color you liked, right? Because who cares? You know, to Anthony's point, there is sig there are signals out there that are stupid. Uh, but we did include some things that were pretty markedly non-standard, which were much better at Google search results. Uh, Google search. <laughs> uh, I don't think we did that, but maybe we should have. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, reverse vanity searches. <laughs> and then the other thing I think to keep in mind is. Um, if you, if you dig down one level on, on what wins in Kaggle, they often aren't individual algorithms. They're often algorithms ensembled together, where you take multiple weak predictors and you join them together in a relatively smart way. Uh, adding more information to a decision, using your example of a hiring decision, may yield a very noisy predictor. But if you have multiple noisy predictors that are noisy in different ways, what are called the model variants, and you ensemble them together, you almost always get better answers than any of the individual models. So when I think about adding machine learning to processes like hiring, I focus on how can I get multiple noisy learners uh, and join them together. And that's ultimately what we did uh, in our uh, sort of numberization, if you will, of the hiring process at Google, and it's what we do at Zest. I'd also okay. like to footnote the question just to 
identify something that will become a tension here, which is you immediately went to saying this gets in the way of things that used to be, this, this adds noise to what used to be a fairly simple process of common sense and experience. Well, why are common sense and experience things that win? Why are those necessarily true? We're That's reifying the time. self as the great determinant. Because we've been doing that for a long time. I would be disappointed to find out I was not fired because on, on account which is different from my employment history. But frequently Just because I wear different kind turn, of shoes. Frequently experiences turn out to be a poor guide. I mean, mm. most neuroses that orig originate in childhood tend to be misperceptions of what was going on or environments from which you are now removed. So it's just a comment. And I've had people in this field, excuse me, talking about how we're going to have to move towards not necessarily favoring our gut. People default to thinking, well, my, sen my common sense is telling me this. But maybe you have to start paying attention to other signals. Your common sense wasn't necessarily correct. I say all this just to identify a kind of point about the self and, and its place in the world that's going to be under tension in this kind of a environment. There's a great Wikipedia page with a list of all the biases that afflict humans. Uh, <laughs> it's really long. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Danny Kahneman's work is just epic. And on hiring Bob Zions's work at Michigan, where he goes through, takes more or less those biases and shows, hey, they're amazingly predictive in hiring. Yeah. Other questions? Well then, we're working just with the pen. Give them a hand. Thank you very much.